Friends, welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast here in the week of January 21st, 2019. And just a little reminder to you, if you haven't consecrated your year, we talked about that in our December 31st, January 1st, first week of January podcast about how wonderful it is to consecrate our year to Christ, our calendar, ask for words over it. Just a reminder uh, to do that if you haven't had a chance. Now, we're picking up with part two this week in a series on envy that originally aired two years ago, but we just felt so compelled to bring back to our audience because it's more true now than it was then, and we need to protect our hearts in this. So welcome back to part two. I'm forgetting where I first ran into the tall poppy yeah, the syndrome. Puppy. I know Lewis speaks to it. Yeah, and he writes about it in The Abolition of Man. I, I ran into it in Australia. If you, you kind of do a quick Wikipedia of it, Australia is one of the places kind of noted for this idea of the tall poppy syndrome. And basically, it's the idea that nobody should stand out, mm. um, that nobody should should shine, that to be the tall poppy is actually a bad thing. Um, and so you'll find... Uh, very deep in the Australian culture, they have a very healthy aversion to pride. Yes. But but unfortunately, it's also kind of devolved into no one should stand out. And, yes. And therefore, you know, achievement and awards and kind of things that you might see in other places of the world don't operate as freely in, in that kind of a culture. The etymology of it is absolutely fascinating. It, the concept originates from accounts in Herodotus and Livy, Mm. Um, And Periander, the king, had sent a herald to a a very wise man and inquired in what way he would best and most safely govern his city. And and the wise man took the messenger outside of his town and entered into a sown field. And as he walked through the wheat, he just kept lopping off the tallest ears of wheat and throwing them away. And it was this secret message The messenger didn't understand it, but he went back and told Periander, yeah, it was really weird. I went to the counselor, and he didn't give me an answer, but he took me through this field and just lopped off all the things. And Periander knew, oh, I'm supposed to kill all of the aristocracy so that no one can threaten my reign. That was where the tall poppy thing originated. Welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge and my son Blaine continuing conversation from last time in the realm of envy, unpacking um, what envy is, why it's on the list of seven deadly sins, why it's near the top of the list, um, how it's the oldest, frankly, um, sin because of Satan's envy of God and betrayal um, even before the fall of man, and, and more importantly, talking about a culture of envy that we live in now we live in a culture of envy, and it's so pervasive and it's so damaging. I think most people don't recognize how awful it actually mm-hmm. is. So we're picking up a conversation from last time, and I was starting with the tall poppy syndrome because it reminded me of the Khmer Rouge. And, yes. I mean, when, when communism came into Cambodia a number of years ago, I don't know if you've seen the film The Killing Fields. It's a very, very, very difficult and disturbing, but very, very powerful film. And basically, you know, communism's argument is, back to Dorothy Sayers, you know, definition of envy, it begins plausibly with, why should not I enjoy what others enjoy? But it ends by demanding, why should others enjoy what I may not? And therefore, we're going to level all the tall poppies. We're going to cut down. And envy's the great leveler. And and as what happened in Cambodia has happened in a number of dictatorships, and and particularly Marxist takeovers, and that is university professors, business owners, anyone who stands out, anyone that is remarkable, you you cut them down. You literally kill them all. Yes. So that you can you can establish a radically egalitarian. I always feel like I am, I'm going to be, you know, like found and killed uh, by my friends for saying this, but it is frankly true that many of the more destructive uh, Marxist or, you know, neo-Marxist regimes uh, have also been the most equal societies in the history of the world. And it's not 
actually like a surprise that they're actually the most violent to prove that concept. Um, you don't really need to go to the gulag. Like if you're married, you can actually kind of just observe how hard it is for your wife to make and keep good friends. Like, and what I mean is, like, my wife is fairly exceptional. Like, she loves Jesus. And because of that, she experiences a lot of freedom. And because of that, she has, like, a really hard time, especially in new communities, making friends. Because actually, one of the first things that happens in in kind of the community of women, and this isn't unique to women, men do it as well, but it was just what I was thinking of, is be- she comes in and she looks pretty amazing. And then rather than like getting blessing and having people want to mm. like be be around her and making friends, like she actually experiences an incredible amount of uh, resentment mm. and alienation mm. because her glory is seen as threatening to the point where, you know, she has one very close friend in the world, but it is one. Mm -hmm. And it's just that tall poppy thing of um, if you bring a unique glory into a community that is not ready to respond or is not Mm -hmm. equipped to bless glory, what ends up happening is they turn on it. Yeah, and it's fascinating because back to that uh, on the previous episode, I I mentioned uh, some research that came out in 2013 on, on social media from a couple of German universities, and I was saying that people in their 30s were found to most likely envy family happiness. The rest of that um, says, while women are more likely to envy physical attractiveness. And I think every woman knows that, you know, um, that's just something that's true. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to unpack envy in order to be free of it, in order to also disarm its destructive effects. But um, there's a famous story that's told of two great Shakespearean actors in England, Sir John Gielgud and Sir Lawrence Olivier, great, great actors from, from the previous century. And Gielgud confessed when Sir Lawrence Olivier played Hamlet in 1948 and the critics raved, I wept. It's that thing of, um, I don't just admire that you are married. I don't just admire that your children are wonderful. I don't just admire that your church is growing. I, I, I am envious of it. I, I feel the pain that mine is not. Why isn't my church growing like yours? And that, ooh, that, that thing about Gielgud and Sir Lawrence Olivier, whose Hamlet was famous and amazing, I, I just want to keep this honest. That It's not like we're free from this and we're just finger-pointing um, I had not had the pleasure of reading Anne Voskamp until mm-hmm. recently. And I picked up her, not her first book, but her second one, The Broken Way. It, and the writing in that book is so extraordinary. I quickly had to ask myself, can I simply enjoy the glory yes. of this without a tinge of Oh dang! Somebody's somebody's more glorious than I am at this. I mean, and even more so, what I found was, can I pray for her success mm. as a writer? Can, can I mean honestly, right now, can I just get down on my knees and say, Jesus, I pray you absolutely bless this book. I pray you bless this writer. How wonderful that there's someone so skilled at this, and 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 that may translate into your world uh, of they're more financially successful, or they're a better athlete or their family, or whatever. I mean, can we, can we praise excellence and simply love it? I, this is a very similar experience when um, some friends were in town and uh, another writer, a um, friend of Emily's, and she had brought a book of essays with her by an essayist, Charles D'Ambrosio, who I didn't know at the time, but is regarded as one of the greatest living essayists in our time. And, you know, I, like, casually picked up the book one afternoon, then had this, like, jolting, like, convulsing experience as I started reading this guy's prose. And it was, like, truly exceptional. And I was, like, still kind of, like, tied in a knot when Emily and her friend got home. And I was just, I was kind of looking for, like, 
man, don't you have the same experience? And I was like, oh my gosh, it's almost painful reading Charles. And then really impressively, my wife's friend kind of like looked at me kind of with a weird looking shrug and was like, uh, th- there's room for all of us. Like, and it was fascinating in the contrast of mm. she was able uh, to see mm. an exceptional writer mm. and be glad that his writing was exceptional, whereas I viewed his excellence as a direct threat to my position or hoped for position in the world. Yeah, exactly. So, friends, we did this at the end of the first podcast, and I'm remiss not to have opened the second. I, I actually want to pray um, because what we're exploring is something so deeply invasive in our societies. It's just become cancerous, and the enemy is going to be all over this, misinterpreting what we're saying, bringing accusation, bringing confusion. I just don't want anything but goodness and love. So we're going to pause and we're going to say, Jesus, would you please shepherd our hearts, our thoughts, our attitude, our posture, as we, a community of people, explore this really important thing. Would you please guard us? Like, we choose goodness. We choose the kingdom. And we rejoice in your glories, God. And just ask you to shepherd this only in the context of love and of your kingdom in your name. In this second podcast, what I really want to do is is drill a bit more into the warfare aspect of it because it actually is one of the most surprising parts. I had confessed in the first um, episode that I I just kind of thought envy was sort of a picadillo, you know? Like, what? Like, it's, you know, it's an issue, um, like holding grudges or something that, you know, we shouldn't do. Uh, But but my gosh, it's it's not up there on the level of murder, or, you know, adultery or, or you know, blasphemy. Or, and, and I just have to say, friends, like, I have been woefully naive about this. Like, envy is one of those things that you begin to pick this thing and start kind of uncovering more and more of it. And you realize, oh, my gosh, it's, it's absolutely diabolical. Now, in our first show, I said that I believe envy is the first sin and therefore the gravest, because it was Satan's sin uh, prior even to the fall of man. He could not bear the glory of God and, and therefore rebelled against him. And, you know, he wanted heaven's throne. He wanted worship. And as I've described in, in other situations, if you look at like the most harmful, evil, destructive empires, you know, the kings and queens, the leaders of those empires, they, they don't want just power. They want worship. They want to be worshipped, and that's like that's the original sin. It's actually not the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Envy is, but I was reading a wonderful little book that I'm flipping through right now to find by Joseph Epstein on envy, and he says, envy, to qualify as envy, has to have a strong touch, sometimes more than a touch, of malice behind it. And He says the first recorded case of envy is that of Cain killing his brother Abel. Okay, maybe it's the first recorded um, because the history of Satan hasn't yet been quite told yet, but it also uh, could be said accurately that there is not a small amount of envy represented in Adam and Eve's decision to take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, simply because as Satan is spinning this alternative narrative and he gets them to believe that God is holding out on them. But the thing that he sells them on is you won't die. You'll be like God. Yeah. So this has got a long evil history to it. And in our current culture, um, it's so cloaked and so disguised, um, largely because, as we pointed out previously, who wants to admit this sin? You know, I, I, we're able to admit, you know, greed or covetousness, perhaps, you know, to our small group. We're able to admit moments of rage, right, or bitterness, but envy is often disguised. But what we want to get into is, is its ravening effects. And so, First, a story. Um, some friends of ours have a lovely home that they worked very, very hard 
um, to build and spent a lot of time over the years. They live in the Pacific Northwest and, and they have a lovely home. Okay. And, and as I was talking with my friend about envy, as we were beginning to kind of unpack some of these things, he has this long silence. And then he looks at me and he says, oh my gosh. He says, I've never really thought that someone else's envy had an effect on me. I've certainly not wanted to indulge it myself nor give place to it, but I've never considered that it might have an external impact coming to me from the other direction. And here's the story he went on to tell. He says, my wife has been so grieved over the years because I've not really enjoyed our home. Mm. I don't enjoy being there. I prefer traveling. I, I'm restless when I am there. And what he began to connect the dots was they had experienced so much envy from their church community. They're, they're one of the more wealthy families in, the, in their church. And they built this beautiful home, and it was the object of envy. And what he was beginning to identify was, and that had a ravening effect that had an erosive effect, that this, the sin of envy against them diminished his own enjoyment of the gifts of God in their lives. It's such a painful story because right away I can think of, you know, one specific story in my life where out of college and, yeah, you know, still writing, still making art, but you know, my post-college experience was different. You know, I had a brother who I could work with, which is unique enough for many people. And, you know, we were connected to Ransom Tart. And so, you know, we knew people who we could pitch projects to, and we started building Ansons. And I remember that I would kind of calculate first whether or not I wanted to tell some of the people in my community about it because in real time, not just the spiritual ramifications, but right away, there would just kind of be this almost a sneer at it. And then I found that it was actually beginning to inform like what I wanted to enjoy or how much I wanted to enjoy it because I knew that even like that joy in my own life would provoke envy, which would be so destructive. It felt like it wouldn't even be worth you know, the initial experience of happiness. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's that tall poppy thing. Don't stand out. Don't stand out. Don't rise above. Don't shine. Yeah, I just like how, in many ways, the book of James could be seen as like a manifesto on envy because it's in there, like, I don't know. It's in there a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, somebody can check me. But the language put around it of, you know, the author of James goes, do not tolerate envy where it exists. And then the phrase he goes, there will be every vile practice. And then he goes on and begins setting up what it looks like. And he goes, uh, you do not have, and so you murder. Yeah. You covet and you don't yes. receive. So like you fractiously quarrel. Like the biblical writer understood that envy was going to result in a massive level of violence. Yes, yes. Okay, gang, so let me just connect some dots for you. Um, right now in this episode, we're talking about the impact of envy that is against us, envy coming from outside, envy coming our direction. We'll come back to our own hearts and, and holiness. But you understand that through the sin of Adam and Eve, through the fall of man, that's how Satan became prince of this world. He was never meant to be. Satan was never created to be the prince of this world. Mankind was. We were meant to be the lords of the earth, small l, mm -hmm. under the king of kings and the lord of lords, okay? Sin is what opens the door for spiritual warfare to get in, okay? And, you, and you'll see that. You'll see that in family lines. Like if there's rage in a family line, you know, it, it opens the door for foul spirits of rage, for oppression, that kind of thing to get in, for abuse, you know. You'll see this happening if there's pride and arrogance in, a, in an organization or a university, intellectual pride. Spirits of that will get in. Okay, so sin is what opens the door. Envy, as we're beginning to understand it and see its ravening effects, envy is a destroyer. Mm -hmm. It wants to level. That was the Richard III um, that I was quoting at the beginning of our of our series here. And, and he, he says, you know, since I cannot be a lover and enjoy the idle pleasures of these days, I will prove a villain and hate the idle 
pleasures of these days. And then he goes on in the monologue to say, I've laid these plots, here are my plans, I'm going to turn my brother against my brother. I'm going to... And he, he brings down an entire kingdom. It's murderous, right? So envy is a destroyer. Cain and Abel, envy is a destroyer. And if people are envying you, it allows a devouring of the good gifts of God in your life. Yes. Okay, and and just to show you how sober this is, do you know that it was because of envy that Jesus went to the cross? Both Mark and Matthew make this very clear. They it says that the rulers of the Jews turned Jesus over out of envy. Right. And and Pilate notices it, when he tries to acquit or he's working so carefully to navigate the situation and it throws in there uh, because he knew that they had arrested him out of their envy. Out of envy, gang. So we're talking something that really is um, wicked and yes. insidious. And to be the object of it, it diminishes joy. It diminishes your enjoyment of things, but it is an assault on your glory. Yeah. For Francis Bacon, he said that there was no distinction between envy and witchcraft because the only satisfaction of envy was to remove the entire endowment of virtue or of riches from a person and either put it on another or simply destroy it. Exactly. And that's why when we were quoting Dorothy Sayers um, earlier in the series, she said, envy is the great leveler. If it cannot level things up, it will level them down. And the words constantly in its mouth are my rights and my wrongs. At best, envy is a climber. At its worst, it is a destroyer. Rather than have anybody happier than itself, it will see us all miserable. Now, the people who are envying you may not actually be wishing all of that harm, but you have to understand it opens the door for the one who does wish you that harm. Yes. And we, we just had a really bizarre and, and awful experience of this the other night. A group of us were gathered to just talk about the beauty of the gospel, and we were really reveling in some of the most beautiful expressions of the gospel and just talking about its exquisite promises. And there was this warfare that was present. You could just feel this hatred and this envy, and it was the envy of the evil one. Mm who hates the kingdom of God and hates the glories and the beauty and the goodness and wants to ravage them. So he does not admire your loving marriage, friends. He, he does not admire your growing church. He does not admire the, the wonderful way you've parented your kids and how well they're doing in school. He's behind this is what I'm trying to say. And if people envy you, that opens a door to him to come in and devour. It's like a devouring kind of thing. If I can't enjoy what you enjoy, then the bottom line is you can't enjoy what I can't enjoy. So it's a thief. It's a stealing thing, and and it will steal glory. It will steal joy. It's a real ravening thing, and we just we wanted to expose this. Um, yeah early in the series to say, you you must take the warfare of this very, very seriously. I mean, Cain killed Abel out of envy. This isn't a little embarrassing character flaw. <laughs> to give another illustration of the power of this, making a long story short, for a number of years, Sam, Luke, and I, we were all living in different states. And every time that we would kind of come back together, we would have, you know, the incredible desire of a reunited family to experience joy, uh, to see how we were doing, but mostly to find uh, that kind of unique, intimate family connection that's so life-giving. And we totally had it in place as his brothers, but we were very aware uh, that we weren't getting it. And it was like frustrating. I remember going back to Washington after one Christmas being like, that was really good. But also I, I felt like mm -hmm. what I was hoping would happen relationally between my brothers and I and my brother's wife and I did not happen until a number of years ago for stumbling on this envy stuff. 
first realizing its enormous destructive power. Mm. And then in one night, together as siblings, with a fairly sober mood, we realized, like, oh my goodness, there is nothing more relationally available for us until we repent of our envy for one another. And then it was literally around the circle, not in a progression, but as it was coming up, like, I have seen, you know, your joy with your wife and and I haven't blessed it and I ask your forgiveness and I have seen, mm. you know, your success in school and I haven't blessed it and instead I've envied and it's gotten in mm. of things that I could recommend to do to clear the air. It was the most transformational thing we've done as siblings probably in our life because it took away the permission of the enemy to keep taking and destroying in these mm-hmm. key relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, gang, just want to give you some instruction on this um, and not kind of leave you dangling. James 4, 7, um, submit therefore to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee. It always begins with that first step of, wow, Jesus, forgive me for letting this in. Forgive me for my envying, forgive me for my participation in this, or just just my lack of ability to bless other people's happiness. You know, back to that Facebook study, like, Lord, forgive me that other people's happiness causes me unhappiness, that it just immediately takes me to my own issues. Forgive me, God. Why can't I just bless that? I bless that you're married. I bless that you have children. I bless that you have a beautiful home. I bless that your church is larger than mine. Like, I bless that. Forgive me. So it always begins there. But because to be sinned against allows the enemy in, someone else has opened the door for the ravening, you also need to shut down envy Mm -hmm. coming against you. And here's the really startling thing. We normally, when we're praying against um, something that feels like spiritual attack, we bring the cross of Christ against it. One of many, many passages in Colossians 2, and having disarmed the rulers and authorities, he triumphed over them through the cross. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the cross disarms, you know, the foul spirits. The cross does not work against envy. And the reason why is it was envy that sent him to the cross. And we were like, wow, Lord, this is super weird and don't quite get it, but say some more. And he said, you have to bring my love against it. Only my love Mm. works against this. And so we just learned to begin to pray the love of God against envy. If you know the particular source of it, Lord, we forgive. Mm -hmm. We, We forgive those who can't rejoice in our joy, who envy our gifts or glory. Uh, We forgive that because by forgiving the sin, you really disarm it. And then we bring the love of God, the love of God against envy. We bring the love of God and the glory of God, the glory of the Lord against envy to cut it off. And it's something that you probably kind of want to put in your quiver, put this in your toolbox, like make this at least a category, make it part of your consciousness that, you know, I'm not saying you got to do this all the time and I don't want to, I don't want to start a witch hunt. Okay, but the fact is, it's really prevalent, and it's really devouring, and it lets in the enemy's murderous rage. It lets in his, we're going to cut down every tall poppy thing. Yes. I would even say, places I've found it personally helpful, uh, some great litmus tests for it being envy. Uh, One would be the loss of joy or passion and actually some of the key areas of your gifting. Exactly. So say that again. You're trying to identify the warfare. And if you are experiencing a loss of joy or passion in a key area of your gifting, it is likely envy that is getting in against that. And I find that to be true. Now, what Blaine means is not your envy. Gang, be very careful to distinguish these things. We're not saying, so go on an internal witch hunt and find all the places in you that aren't. No, no, no. What we're talking about is someone outside is envying your gifts, your joy, your glory, whatever it is, your positions, your success, your health, right? Yes. They're envying your happiness. This is the whole Facebook thing, right? And if you are finding a diminished joy in your own life, yes, it's not because of your envy. It's actually because this is coming against you and it's allowing a kind of eroding. 
Yes. Even just to give another story there of like, Em and I have a young marriage and therefore have like all of the wonderful things a young marriage is kind of supposed to have. Like, you know, like there is the fresh playfulness, like things are new. We were noticing uh, when we lived in Canada, like a kind of heaviness, especially being around people who had been married for a while. And we simply began to realize like, oh my gosh, like this is envy getting in simply because we're experiencing like what a young marriage is experiencing and, and they're not anymore. They're working their way into the joys of like a 10-year marriage, but like, you know, they don't have like, you've been married for three months and you're like, we stayed up all night talking. Like yeah. finding like, oh my goodness, as the place Jesus is bringing us joy, a young marriage, we're suddenly experiencing like a kind of dullness, um, disinterest, disappointment. And then it was like, oh, with envy in the quiver, let's try forgiving. Let's try praying envy against it. And is hugely helpful. Yeah, praying, praying the love of God yeah, against, against envy. Against envy, gang. This is going to be so huge for you. And I'm sorry that I have to give this next piece of advice, but you do need this. Be very careful who you share your joy with. I'm so sorry to say that. I wish we lived in a culture of admiration. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about that in a coming episode, but. We don't live in a culture of admiration. We live in a culture of envy. We live in a culture of the triumph of the offended self. And that's our Mm. next episode. But But there's just this offended self out there that just unfortunately despises other people to be happier than they are and are unable to bless. They're they're unable to rejoice with those who rejoice. And so I have counseled a number of people recently, be very careful who you tell your successes to. Be very careful what you're posting online in your various social media accounts. Actually, frankly, be very careful who you tell about that wonderful holiday. Be very careful who you tell about that fabulous family Christmas. And I would extend, uh, be careful and discerning about who you tell what God is doing in your life uh, because it is actually what God is doing in his life and is showing him that gets a certain Joseph sold into slavery. So Yeah, it, there he is, Joseph into slavery. And unfortunately, it's tragic that we're having to give this counsel. But gang, you just have to be wise about this, especially the gifts of God, especially the gifts of God, because those are so exquisitely beautiful. And so, you know, Jesus is doing a new work of, of inner healing or Jesus is showing you these beautiful truths in Scripture. The Father is bringing a new level of intimacy and you're really experiencing being a daughter or a son. Be very careful who you share that with um, because it will incite envy. And, and you just don't want to live under the ravening effects of it. This isn't saying, therefore, don't be a tall poppy. And more on that when we get to a culture of admiration. I think you should shine. I think you should be great. I think you should be fantastic. Paul says this wild thing in Romans where he says, you know, I'm actually trying to provoke my countrymen, my my Jewish brothers and sisters to envy so that they might take a closer look at the gospel. Um, Shine, shine, yes. I'm not saying, you know, put it under a bushel. No! (laughs) I'm going to let it shine. I'm not saying don't shine. I'm just saying in those beautiful treasures that God is giving you, just be careful who you share those with. Be discreet uh, with your abundance because it will provoke. And, And what we're trying to describe here in this podcast is how do you shut down envy? And you certainly, certainly, certainly repent of it yourself. And step two is you forgive those who are envying. Because when we forgive sins, it disarms the enemy's ability to use them as an open door. So that itself is very helpful. And then you've got to bring the love of God and the glory of God, bring Jesus Christ against the envy directly. Like we pray against envy. And if you know, you know, certain family members are doing this or people in your church or at work, you pray directly against it. Um, Not cursing them, we bless. We bless, but but just to cut off the envy there and then the last piece of wisdom and then just be discreet uh, of who you share your glories with because in this 
age, which is the triumph of the offended self. Envy is raging. And you don't still want to go, you who over here, shoot my direction. You know, I'm a big old target for your envy. You just, <laughs> you just don't, you don't want to do that indiscriminately. We are going to pause here in a multi-part series that we're doing on envy. And can I also say, please just rejoice in the fact that Blaine and I get to do this together and don't envy the fact that I'm doing this with my son. <laughs> Uh, we want to rejoice in those who rejoice, and we want to bless everyone's particular glories. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast with John and Blaine Eldridge. <laughs> <laughs>